Welcome to another episode of Trans Bra. I am your host, Mars, and I am not here with Smartass because he had some things to take care of. So it's going to be just me today and uh, my guest, Jadis. How's it going? I'm fine and sassy. You? <laughs> Pretty good, thanks. Jadis, for anybody that doesn't know anything about you and you kind of wanted to like describe who you are to people, do you want to go ahead and do that? Yeah, so I don't have much of a personality, but um, <laughs> I'm known a little bit for being eccentric in just quirky behaviors. I'm a weird person in person. I don't sound like it on necessarily online except for my drawing and I'm known for castrating myself. That's about it. Gotcha. Okay. So with that said, just in case anybody didn't pick up on any of that, you're a transsexual woman, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, male to female transsexual. But I guess I don't really know anything about you. I kind of want to just start at the beginning a little bit. You don't have to get into too much detail, but what was it like for you growing up as a transsexual woman and kind of, you know, when did you figure that all out? So I never grew up as a transsexual woman. I grew up thinking that I was gay. So as kids, we were taught that we couldn't be feminine if we were males. So we got punished for being sissies and, and whatnot. And I came from a very conservative background, so my parents talked about how the gay community is corrupting everybody, and they're all... They corrupt people by diddling kids and making more of themselves that way. And then, of course, you get AIDS and die. Yeah, I had this internalized homophobia for so long, and I hated myself for it because I was attracted to both boys and girls. But I always, at the same time, felt like a girl. And always was jealous of my sisters for being free to be girls and, and whatnot. So in my head, though, I had convinced myself that I was gay and that I was a horrible abomination. And also that it was impossible to transition because I was told a lot of myths about transition and what a, a trendy really is. So mm -hmm. No, I guess like one of the things that I mean, I think, you know, too, because you get involved in some of these debates on Twitter is like when you say things like, you know, I kind of always felt like a girl. Like, is there a way to elaborate on what that, that means? Yeah, kind of. So I have current views that have sort of shaped that, and I'm more into, like, some of my perception now might shape my past reflection. So mm -hmm. I know that I always felt feminine, and I felt that I wanted to be free to radiate that feminine energy that I saw in all the other girls. And there's the nurturing part, the stereotypical nurturing that, of course, you see in the... I, and I get that, like, a lot of what I fixated on as a kid were some of the stereotypes. Not not like the fetishistic stereotypes that a lot of autogonic thoughts seem to fixate on, but yeah. some of the better ones, you know. So I thought that, you know, I wanted to be, like, a, a strong female role model. Like, so, kind of like, imagine, like, a, a Viking. Well, to be honest, my parents really shaped that one into me because they were very big Vikings. But, like, Viking warriors. So, as kids, our parents wanted us to be, like... <laughs> Viking warriors, sons and daughters. And my dead name actually does happen to have a Viking name in it. All my siblings have very strong Germanic names too. But I wanted to be like, I don't want to be like a kind of like a Valkyrie, but still have that nurturing component that you see, that love that's. Anyway, um, so like I said, though, some of this is going to be clouded by my current mm -hmm. perception of what it means to be female because. There was a time, though, that I, I did used to fixate too much on the superficial things, and that's just not not accurate. Then again, I think that kids generally do fixate on the easier um, stereotypes. That's the first thing they do is they catch on to that. So a lot of, like my brother, for example, who was big into sports, like very superficial, stereotypical male, talk, like he did toxic masculinity to the point that he's even homophobic. But um, I, of course, I wanted to be a little bit more flamboyant, couldn't get away with that, at least not 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 where anyone was around. Maybe in front of my one of my sisters in secret. Of course, she would lord that over me. Like er everything I confided into her about my feelings, she would you know she would be there for me and she'd be like, oh yes, tell me all this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm there for you. But at the same time, anytime something uh, there was an opportunity to exploit that and sort of blackmail me, and she would she would just subtly bring it up just to remind me, hey, I've got something over you. So you better play ball. Mm -hmm. So would you say like, I mean, for you, your upbringing, it sounds like, you know, you're not really allowed to express yourself very much. And in that sense, do you feel for maybe some kids that are growing up today that might feel similar and are kind of going towards thinking that they're trans because they don't think that it's possible just to like not conform and 
express themselves however. I, I wonder if that's true because it seems to me that now more than ever it's easier to transition, that it's much more welcoming. It, there was a time where with my own mother, she said that she, she wished I had been, just been gay instead of transitioned. And I've heard that with a lot of people is they would just rather just be gay, just be lesbian. Mm -hmm. You don't have to transition. And, and I can understand that to a point, surely. And, and certainly I think there are a lot of people that they really probably are just gay or, or, or lesbian. They just, they're confused. The thing is, what I'm seeing as a, a trend right now is that there are a lot of people that are, seem to be pushing their kids into transitioning because they don't want their kids to be gay because they, they end up making the mistake that, that some people make of, you know, well, maybe they, maybe they aren't gay. Maybe they're like the parents are, are actually homophobic and they're scared. So they, they end up do, make the, making the mistake that the children make or like, like what I sort of made as a kid. Although to be fair, I, I really, that hasn't changed. Like even after even after having my surgery and all that, like living my life as I am, mm -hmm. nothing's changed. My outlook is still the same. Yeah. When did you start transitioning? So that's kind of a weird one. So I have been wanting to pursue hormones since my well, since I learned what they could do uh, in my senior year of mm -hmm. high school. But while I had wanted that, I didn't do anything with it. Then by the time I turned 20, I enlisted in the Air Force. And let's just say I wasn't in there long, but to make a long story short, just being in there for about not even, not even four months into it, dysphoria really, really got to me. Like I've had dysphoria all pretty much seven, as long as I can remember, but it really, really got to me to the point that I, I broke down and, um, I actually tried to do something about that. And that's when I really started seeking hormone therapy and mm -hmm. any, even like beard retardant cream, things like that. And yeah, I started pursuing that, found online resources for it. I got found out. Of course, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not very discreet. So it wasn't hard for anybody to find out what I was doing. Suffice to say, I got kicked out of the Air Force for that. And then... I also got married in the Air Force, so my... Hey, hold on, sorry. You got kicked out of the Air Force because rumors were spread that you were... Because I tried to transition, and also because I was suicidal from the dysphoria, and uh, it was a medical discharge. I, I mean, I'm kind of curious to hear your take on that. This wasn't part of what I had planned to talk to you about, but, you know, with everything going on right now with the military debate, like, and your experience... Which, by the way, I'm not saying that because you experienced it like that. That's the case for every, you know, trans person. But I am, I'm just generally, I want to hear what your view is. All right. So I, I, I can't give you the, the kind of um, story that you could get from someone that's actually really served. But Right, of course. All I can tell you is that, like, for that race time, I was in there only through two tech schools. That's it. I didn't even get past my second tech school. I was two weeks from graduating. But what I can say is they were within their rights to discharge me because I was not useful. I was not, not only was I not useful, I was a danger to myself. Yeah. If they had let me transition, I, I probably would have been fine, maybe. But of course, I would have to see a bunch of counselors. Thing yeah. is like this, um, I get why the U.S. military right, or any military would have reservations about having someone who's transsexual in their or you could say transsexual or transgender. Anyone that suffers dysphoria, how about that? Because I mean, you could be transgender and still not be transsexual. Yeah. But anyone that suffers uh, dysphoria is a risk to themselves and to those around them. And so it's, there's going to be like a cost benefit analysis. Like you're, you're going to really want to weigh out, weigh out the, the benefits on that. And it comes down to how much time you have, has already been invested into it. For example, let's say I, I had been in the military for three years and I've mm -hmm. got, you know, thousands of dollars worth of training, you know, I'm, I'm a mean lean fighting machine. And then I want to transition. That's a different story from, you know, I'm just now getting in and I can't make it past my second time school because that's how bad this story is. So imagine what it'd be like to put me in a combat area. That's a very, yeah. it's, it's, it's really, it's a tricky, tricky subject. And so one of the things that I would say is you got to bear in mind that hormones Mm -hmm. They do shape your mind. They shape your emotions. And if your hormone levels are out of whack, they can really, really screw with your, your perception of reality. And so I can understand why they'd be like, nope, we don't want you on something. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that they make clear, even from MEPS, right? 
just getting through the processing of getting into basic training, they tell you they don't even want you getting in there if you are very little taking aspirin because they don't want someone that is um, potentially relying on a substance yeah. that is going to get them through something where in a combat zone, you don't get that substance. So I, I totally get it. Never mind the fact that we're also very expensive because if you're transsexual, you're not just transgender, but you actually want to get surgeries, right? So like if you're a female to male, you're going to want to get top surgeries. If you're male to female, you also want to get a different top surgery, but you want to get, a, you definitely want to get the bottom surgery. And I get female to male ones, bottom surgery too, but to be, be honest, that's not nearly as attainable and uh, the results aren't nearly as, as good. So yeah, and I feel great. I, I really feel for you all. Yeah. I mean, I, I get like people not wanting to pay for that. Although I think Trump had said it was like 250,000, which I, it's not, I think it's like 70, 80,000. I don't know for the women, how much it is, but it depends on what all you're doing, but yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it still costs a lot. I don't know. I'm always pretty torn with the debate because on the one hand, like with your story, obviously you weren't at a place where you should be going to the military, but in the case where maybe you had already fully transitioned and you wanted to serve the country should you be you know banned from doing that is kind of where i'm like well i mean you know so the question is um under am i under the influence of the competing hormones so like for example right now right now i'm not actually on hormones of any kinds i, I don't have because of my castration i don't need to mm -hmm. to worry about testosterone basically sexless Mm -hmm. I still have my, my genitalia, which I would like to have removed, but I don't have gonads, right? So I don't have that testosterone that, from my perspective, is a poison. I felt that, like it was poisoning in my body. I looked at it like a poison, or I looked at it like like a fetus that, like a stillborn, right? So you have a stillborn, and it's still in you, and it's gone septic, and now you have to worry about toxic shock, right? That's how I looked at that. Okay. So it was just poisoning my body and I had to get it out. So once I was gone, you know, well, then I'm neutral. So maybe mm. I don't have the estrogen, which I would still have to be on. But right, you know, it's expensive to get on hormones. <laughs> gotcha. So, um, sorry, just to be clear, because so basically what you're saying is in this moment, although you have been on hormone therapy, you are not now because of circumstances or because you don't want to. No, it's not for not wanting to. It's it's expensive. Okay, gotcha. I mean, just getting to that doctor, you know, seeing a doctor regularly, that's all of that is expensive. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not close to any doctors. And that no. also means taking time off of work and I'm barely surviving. Rent where I am is quite high. So Understandable. Yeah, no, I get that. If you don't mind me asking, but basically because you've had, you know, the surgery, does that, you know, you're not on your estrogen, but you've had surgery does that kind of balance out like dysphoria for you or you know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah, because how I look at it is that I'm, I'm a woman with menopause, right? That's, that's how I <laughs> yeah. look at it. Gotcha. And I, I get some of the same symptoms. So I get hot flashes. Oh really? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it gets really bad because I'm in Arizona. So that it, hot flashes are even brought on by heat. So that a lot of things can trigger it. Yeah. So how long were you transitioning before you said kind of like, fuck this, I need to get surgery because that's weighing on me? It was a lot shorter than I had thought at the time. I didn't realize how fast I was rushing into it, which in retrospect, I'm very great. But started at the age of 20, paused for about a year because I, I went back to my, my now ex-wife. But um, I hadn't told her about what I was doing. I was trying to do stuff in secret, which was a really bad idea. Um, very inconsiderate. The, the fact is, though, she couldn't be a lesbian. That's mm -hmm. fair. That's being true to yourself. Yeah, so after a year, year was over, then I started doing things like laser hair removal, getting on hormones. Uh, In-house pharmacy is very good for that. And so from the age of 20 through 24, by 24, maybe 25, that's when I had, actually it was right before my 25th birthday, I had removed one of my testicles. And then the following year, I removed the other testicle. This is all self-surgery, of course, so it took longer planning and all that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, by 26, I was completely testosterone-free. Yeah, okay. 
So kind of going back to that other question, which you answered and you said your perspective now on feeling like a woman is versus your perspective back when you were younger, because I mean, obviously we see that a lot, you know, online, especially on Twitter, we see a lot of, you know, trans women are women and woman. I feel like a woman. I am a woman, things like that. Like, so what is your take? Like when you think of a woman, like what is kind of mean to you and how relevant is it? like in your day-to-day -day life because for me I feel like when people ask me what a man is at this point I just I <laughs> I'm pretty fed up with that question to be honest well you're fed up with it but I'm curious to know your answer because I, I have, I've never heard the answer before you want my answer first yeah so when people ask me what is a man which I always I know that they're asking this just kind of like in a way of saying you know you're not a man because okay like if we're gonna get like real yes technically I'm a biological female, you know, and there's no denying that. And I would never deny that. But to me, when I walk out the door, like I'm a man period to the world. So it doesn't matter. I'm living as a man at the very least is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when people ask me that, it's like, I, I really don't want to get into a debate on my existence. It's just kind of boils down to, you know, when I go to the doctor, do I tell them I'm a female? Of course, because it makes a lot of sense. If I don't, I'm kind of screwed because I might not get the proper help that I need because of biology. But when it comes to am I a man or not in the social world, you know, at work, with my friends, things like that, like, yeah, I mean, they people don't walk around asking me what is a man, you know, it's all always online. So um, it's kind of one of those things where like, I feel like there's kind of two, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it makes me sound crazy by saying that there's two answers to it, but there kind of is because I feel like socially, a man is something different than biologically. You know what I mean? Right. So you're just two uh, perspectives, but is there not another one? Like, for example, do you think there's like a spiritual component? Do you think that like there's such a thing as like a masculine energy or a feminine energy? Sure. Like it's DNA, right? I mean, I think everybody has a little bit of both, but I feel like I lean more on one than the other. Was that the key reason as to why I transitioned? No. You know, for me personally, being a transsexual has a lot to do with my body than socially. Yes, of course, when I go out socially and I'm treated as viewed as a man, of course, that does great, better things for my mental health than my past. But a lot of it to me has been just being able to medically transition and seeing these changes on my body, which is a constant reminder to me that, you know, biologically, that's how a man or woman technically is, right? You know, for example, I don't like it when people are like, assign female at birth, assign man at birth, because to me, like, it's like, I mean, it probably, it, technically it is, you know, somebody looked at you and said, you're a man or, or you're a female or, or male, but the doctor isn't really deciding that your biology is. Right. I mean, that, that's kind of a given, right? So yeah, I hear what you're saying and it does make sense. Mm -hmm. So like for me, if I look in the mirror and I don't see a woman, if I see that masculine image I had seen before, I freak out. It, it shuts me down and I, mm -hmm. cause I, I need to see what I know should be there. So like I have an image of what I am in my mind's eye. And if I don't see that, then so I something wrong. It's something alien, which is actually what happened when I was in the Air Force. Like I ended up doing what a lot of people like you would love to do, which is you see a very different person you see a very masculine person a huge transformation you're like mm -hmm. from your perspective i imagine you're like awesome this is great this is exactly where i want to be that's exactly the opposite though of where i was in my headspace is like this is this is not yeah. like because i had always danced that very fine line of androgyny for so long that's how i kind of got away with it in my own head mm -hmm. of not having to transition because i i didn't think that i could but also because i thought well if i can't be feminine then I can at least be something in between I could be more or less comfortable with that because I didn't have to stick with the masculine I just didn't like being masculine nothing about that interested me whatsoever in fact it repulsed me strangely enough though I'm attracted to masculine men and not at all feminine men but um I think that has to do with like in my head there needs to be like a, a yin yang where like someone has to compliment you so if I'm feminine then I need to be with a a masculine partner to bounce me up yeah makes sense yeah i can relate to that so in my head i need to see that, that image but there's also I, I do want to be accepted as a woman but then the question is you know what does it really mean to be a woman biological reality aside let, let's just say that that wasn't a real factor into it what does it really mean to be a woman and i think that there is 
there is a personality generally associated with cisgendered women. I think there's an energy even. I know that energy resides within me, but I also know that I've been, through socialization, I've been taught to repress a lot of that. And so I've been trying to explore that and, and bring that out. It's really hard. And that's where therapy is very important for transsexuals. It's really being able to, to unpack something that you've gotten out of your way to hide for so long. Mm -hmm. So even after the surgeries, the surgeries aren't enough for us. But anyone that thinks that once you get all your surgeries, you're done, you're not. You're, that's only part of your journey, which is a very important part of the journey because you need to be able to be comfortable in your own skin, but that's not all of it at all. Furthermore, your transition can't just be the end goal. You know, like there needs to be something else in your life after that. Like, okay, I've transitioned to a, a woman. Now what? Like, and I think that a lot of us get too fixated on and getting to that point that we don't know what to do afterwards. Exactly. Yep. A hundred percent. Especially, you know, all these young teenagers, which is like, you know, I've been trying to, I've been coming up with things that I can try to do to change that kind of attitude. But I mean, they don't think about anything else. And I mean, why would you? You're young, you know, which is probably my biggest problem with kids being on blockers or transitioning at a young age. Cause like, they're not thinking about the big picture. You know, they're just thinking about all these changes that are going to come. And then when those come, you're going to think about surgery. Like I knew that taking testosterone without getting surgery right away was going to affect me. I knew that was going to happen, but I didn't want to wait because I feel like I'm older already and I've lost a lot. And so like, I wanted to get something moving, but you know, and I feel like that's the difference between somebody that's young versus someone that's got experiences. Like you can kind of weigh the options and understand how things might impact you. You know what I mean? So I, I know that um, there are some people that, that weigh out the option of like, if I do this, then that's going to affect my ability to, let's say, have kids. There are some, some trans women that still want to have kids before they, they go far enough. And they're, they even Blair yeah. White, she wanted to be able to save her sperm so that she could have a kid that way. So she ended up having to suspend her hormones just so she could do that. But there's some people that before they even get on hormones are like, yeah, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm sure about this. Some people don't even want to get on hormones just because they're afraid of it killing their sex drive. And I, I can sort of attest to the fact that if you're if you're male to female, there's a strong chance that your your libido is going to go down because that's definitely the case with me. But that's not a, an issue for me because sex has never been that important. Sorry, for male to female, that's an issue. So, so there are a lot of male and females that still like to have uh, strong sex drives. They're like, well, I want to be able to please my partner and all that. I actually know someone from work that wants to get on hormones and do a whole transition. I'm talking about someone that has done nothing right now except cross-dress, but that confided in me, yeah, I want to do all these things, but I'm, I'm worried about the consequences if I do that. So I don't know what's going to go on for them. Hmm. So basically, like, sorry, because I don't know a whole lot about that, but uh, essentially what you're trying to say is... A sex drive is something that is impacted for male to female. Yes. Whereas the opposite generally is true for female to male. So your libido generally increases. True, yeah. Does that have to do with your age or is that just, you know what I'm saying? Because I know like for women, as you grow older, obviously your libido goes down. That's true as well, yeah. So partly because you're not producing the sex hormones to the levels that you did before. Some of that is progesterone. You don't produce as much progesterone. You're not, well, I mean... Ovaries and testicles are very similar. They come from the same part at, at some point. And progesterone and testosterone are chemically very, very similar. But then, then again, estrogen is too. Yeah. It's just a slight modification. What's related to cholesterol? And all of this is apparently related to cholesterol. I was unaware of that one. I thought that was fascinating. These hormones, they're all related to cholesterol. Huh. Interesting. Uh, I always like asking people this, but, you know, how did we end up being transsexuals, basically? Like, do you believe it's something that you're just... Do you develop over time and then transition, or is it something that we're just, we can't control? We're kind of born, you know, with this, I don't know, innate desire. So one question you might ask is, if we were born in a different era, would we still be transitioning? In a different era? Like... Yeah, if you mm -hmm. sent us back 500 years, mm -hmm. would we still be trying to live that life? Would we still be trying to transition? Would I still have pursued castration? And I think, yes, I can't say the same for a lot of people, but I think, mm -hmm. yeah, for those of us who are strong enough, absolutely. I think that like, that has been a key motivator. And the thing is like dysphoria is, if you really, really have dysphoria, it's something that has haunted you for some time. And it has haunted me. Like even as a kid, I used to be haunted by erections. I 
hated them. I never wanted anyone to know that I had a penis. I was terrified of, of growing any body hair or mm -hmm. facial hair as a kid. I was scared of my voice changing. I didn't want my voice to get deeper. So I did everything I could as a kid to suppress that. I, I, I didn't want to speak up. I always faced I learned to be soft-spoken in order to yeah. avoid that. So I guess in some ways I've given myself voice training just from the get-go. Yeah. To me, I still hear a masculine voice, but mm -hmm. others hear my voice or feminine. So. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel like when my girlfriend edits my podcast and I have to hear it <laughs> blaring in the other room. I'm like, all I hear is, you know, what she doesn't hear and but yeah i saw this guy on twitter the other day he posted something along the lines of like which i actually relate to this he said something about because he was socialized with women because he was born a female sometimes he catches himself talking to people in kind of a i forget how he worded it but basically you know as a female you're socialized in a way where like you're kind of nurturing to people and at times when you explain things and, and you're trying to get understanding with somebody, your voice kind of goes up a little bit. And he said this and I was like, that is totally something that I can relate to sometimes. I feel like I do that sometimes. Once in a while at work with like a customer and I'm like, fuck, that sounded so girly and, and I hate it. I really do. It makes me just feel like everybody just heard me. And I know nobody probably did. I'm the only one noticing this, but like, it just makes me feel naked in a way. Like everybody knows. My voice still cracks sometimes in that creeps me out oh really wow that's scary uh, yeah that's that's savvy yeah i'm mindful of how i sound yeah i don't know how involved you were ever with like the community but i guess what's your perspective on what the community is like today and how do you think we can fix it so first off the community used to be so much older it used to be predominantly people in their 50s to be honest any support group any any groups in general mm -hmm. First, it was predominantly male to female, and many of them were, well, they had ex-wives and families. So they had to leave their families to transition, Yeah, and many of them were also hyper-feminine. They were this hyper-sexualized image of what it means to be female, which is something I actually have always rejected, this idea that you have to be that way. But for a while, I sort of towed that line. And they, they insisted you always have to wear high heels, you, you need to wear skirts. And in my head, you know, a girl doesn't have to be that feminine. I, I like to wear dresses, but the idea that you'd have to wear all these skirts and, and these very sexual, it just didn't seem right to me. But um, that was what I started off surrounding myself with, that and also drag queens. Because when I really first started transitioning, the only real influences I had that, like, for example, anyone telling me how to do makeup, they were drag queens. Because that's all that was around me. There weren't enough transsexuals in person that could show me how to do makeup. They were all online or at groups that I would have to go out of my way to see, but I'd, I didn't like them enough to want to spend time in their company. Uh, but the drag queens, they had personalities, and I learned to hate those personalities, partly because I dated a couple of them. But they, they ended up uh, teaching me a very scary way of doing makeup. I, I realized, you know, this is a parody of what it means to be feminine. And so in retrospect, you know, I, I really, really hate it, but that's what I started off with. And it took me a while to tone down the makeup to where I'm just wearing eyeliner now. I used to think that, well, I need to wear makeup because that's what everybody's telling me I need to do. Of course, as a kid, I still wanted to be free to, to wear makeup. I just, I thought that was fascinating, but that's not all it is to be female. And I think that's an important thing that, you know, transgender, transgender, gender, non-conforming, transsexuals, anyone that is just exploring the other gender. Just realize, you know, makeup isn't everything. The superficial is not what makes a man a man or a woman a woman. There's more to it than that. There's like mm -hmm. that all the facade. Like there's, for example, if you, you have someone wearing a mask of a woman, but they're a man, you know that they're a man because of how they do everything. Like the way they move, the way they talk, right? So, and I've come across transsexuals, yeah. male to female, female to male, who you absolutely know they are the gender that they identify with because it radiates from them. It comes naturally. There is just, they, they get it. It's not just the social aspect. It's like they have those personality components already in their brain. It just clicked for them. Yeah, some of it is the social part, and they, they picked up on it fast enough to catch up because that's what a lot of us have to do is catch up. And I'm still catching up when it comes to the female socialization part but then again i also mm -hmm. reject some of it too because i'm not convinced that some of our gender socialization is even appropriate 
I lost my thought. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. No, I'm, I mean, I, I agree with, with a lot of what you said. You know, I, I just think like, I think um, socialization and just the way that men and women kind of navigate the world and interact with each other. I mean, it's, I don't think it's ever going to go away despite how much we, you know, I, I understand like there's a lot more maybe gender non-conforming individuals today and that's totally fine. I just, my point is, I don't think these things are going to get smashed. You know, they're always going to kind of exist because I do believe. Well, yeah, I mean, they are always going to exist. The fact that they exist yeah. in every single society. There's no such thing as a genderless society out there. Yeah, because I, I also believe that like a lot of that is just, it's kind of, I don't know, innate or uh, hormonal. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just. No, there, there is a biological basis to it. There are. Biological. That's what I meant to say. Sound, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, biology will prescribe certain behaviors. Like you're, you're going to be more likely to exhibit certain behaviors. Mm-hmm. Once you exhibit those behaviors and others see those behaviors, it becomes the norm, right? And so the norm over time, of course, becomes a rule. And the question is where I, I've come up with this uh, axiom of, you know, a deviation over time becomes the norm. Anything that happens over time. Yeah becomes the norm. Once it's the norm, it come, becomes the rule. So you have to be careful about the things that you let become the rule because, or become the norm because it will become the rule. So right now it's, it's becoming a deviation of gender nonconformists passing themselves off as transgender. Mm-hmm. We're letting that happen. Eventually that's what you might actually see is laws reinforcing some of those misconceptions. I mean, we actually are sort of seeing that right now where in Canada, it's considered child abuse if you don't let your child transition. You don't let them get on hormones. Like, you actually have courts ordering parents to get them on hormone therapy. I thought that was happening. Maybe it could be Canada, too. I could have sworn I saw that in Europe, too, or maybe. Well, it's happening all over the, the Western world. That's a scary thing, Yeah. actually, because mm-hmm. fortunately, we don't have that here right now, as far as I know. But, yeah, th- this it is scary because a lot of these kids really shouldn't be doing this necessarily. Maybe they should. Like, for example, I always knew, I mean, I've always had gender sport. I always knew I was different and I wanted to be a woman. But at the same time, I think a lot of people, they will go through those phases. A lot of gays and lesbians go through phases similar. In fact, I dated, this is going to get me in trouble with (laughs) some people, um, but uh, I dated a lesbian. And then you might say, well, she wasn't a real lesbian if she was dating a transsexual woman. But she was a lesbian. She really was. And... Mm -hmm. she only liked women and of course i never actually penetrated her so that was a good thing but not that i would have anyway (laughs) i refused to use that part of my body but thing was uh, she had confided in me and said that she had thoughts that maybe she was a boy when she was a teenager but they subsided as she got older and that's that's just true with a lot lot of female to male and i think you hear this with the sisters Mm detransitioners You even hear, uh, it's not just uh, female to male, but male to females as well. Like You hear stories about this kind of confusion that people get. It really is, I think, a conflation of, of gender non-conforming behavior with gender identity. And Yeah. Yeah, because oddly enough, we've, in a way, we're at a place where, for the most part, you can literally walk out of the house dressed like an elephant and it's... Like, you know what I mean? Like, you could do anything, at least in the United States. For the most part, you can dress however. Most people, like, maybe they'll judge you, but you can. So it's like we're pushing gender nonconforming to, like, the very, very far, you know, as far as we can. But at the same time, like, for some reason, these kids are still just feeling the pressure to be in one box. I don't know why I just used that elephant analogy. I feel like that was really stupid. (laughs) But there's a metaphor about like an elephant in the room, but the thing is, maybe that's where I was going. The thing is, in some ways, they're being heard, they're being uh, pushed there by their peers, especially if they're in school, especially if they're part of a youth group. A lot of kids, when they're doing this, they're, if you actually hear stories about kids are doing this together, right? I'm sure you've heard of rapid onset gender mm-hmm. dysphoria. Like, there are kids that are transitioning together in groups, in numbers, you know, that's kind of a weird phenomenon because it used to be like, if you ever heard of a transsexual, first of all, older, second of all, you never hear about them doing it in groups. Mm-hmm. And so it, it tells you there's a social component to it. And so I think it's, yeah, you have the blind leading the blind, 
right? They're telling, they're, they're playing therapist. They're not credentialed. Their kids, but they're they're telling them that this is where they should be going. Why do you think that? Because I read about it online. So it's this access to information that is really, it, it's. Have you ever heard that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing? If you if you haven't heard that, it's, it's a phrase. And, and a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And so that's kind of where we are. You have you have kids that get a little knowledge. They don't know enough about anything, and they run with it. And Sometimes they, they run off cliffs, you know, they, they go way too far and they, they don't know to reflect. They don't have people that challenge them. In some, in some cases, even if they do have people that challenge them, they're not going to listen to them because they're at that age where they don't listen. They're at that rebellious age. It's, it's unfortunate that it has to be all at the same time that the kids are going out of their way to stand out while simultaneously trying to fit in, right? Yeah. And I mean, I know I've heard some women say that they think a lot of it has to do with the internet and it's kind of hard to disagree with that when there's so many YouTube videos, you know, but it's like, what do we do in that case? I mean, is it really realistic to just kind of monitor some of these channels? You know what I mean? So a thing that I observed is like, uh, if you go to Reddit mm -hmm. slash trends, right? R slash trends, you have mixed ages on there. Anyone can post. There is no age filter. Mm -hmm. It's of all ages, if you're old enough to get an account with Reddit, you can post and you can read others. So you can see everybody's posts. I think that's wrong. I think there's a problem with that because you have kids being influenced by adults and adults are encouraging them on a path that maybe isn't right for them, of course. Yeah. It's all very subjective too. So yeah, I think that there needs to be, there needs to be age restrictions. There needs to be also maybe more of an awareness, parents more involved on, on what it means to be trans talk with our kids about what that kind of investment really is. It is a life-changing investment and it isn't right for everybody. And if you can get by without having to transition, if you, if you can, you know, go up to a certain point mm -hmm. without having to go too far, great. Yeah, exactly. The minimum necessary to survive, right? In some cases, you have to go all the way. In, in my case, like, I would love to have a gender reassignment surgery, mm -hmm. but I can survive without it. I, I hate it. I'm still dysphoric. I still have very, very dark moments, but I've gotten to the point where at least I can live because if I hadn't castrated myself, I wouldn't have been able to live. That was, that was a very important life-changing moment. The testosterone would have, well, I'm sure it would have masculinized me even more. Yeah. Not to say that, I mean, obviously, like, I don't want people to think that, like, I don't want to ban, like, or whatever, any YouTubers or anything like that. It's not like that, but I... I do agree, obviously, an age restriction would be smart. But I mean, I think even then, like, YouTube has that, but I feel like there's a way to still bypass that. I don't know. Well, sure. Of course, there's still a way to bypass it, but the thing is, don't make it easy. Yeah. For example, uh, this is interesting. I found it harder to turn on, or sorry, turn off Safe Search on Google. It used to be easy. There used to be just a button. You just go to it and you click it, and then you turn off Safe Search. Now they've changed the website up so much that I don't remember navigate that just to turn it off so sometimes i need to do a search and i need to see something that's not safe for work but mm -hmm. now they've made it harder so i would have to really go out of my way to see something that might be pornographic which is a good thing because you have kids that are online yeah maybe now it's harder for them to find porn maybe maybe it's harder for them to, to find something that is should be age restricted. The thing is, I think that you're more likely to find resources for transitioning as a kid than you are to find porn, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I think that ultimately maybe you're safer with porn than you are with transitioning because transitioning, if you, if you really shouldn't be transitioning, well, the way I look at it is like this. If you don't have gender dysphoria and you transition, you will have gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They both go hand in hand. And, and that's the, the biggest problem with the communities, you know, the ones that are going around saying you don't need dysphoria can just be trans. The word trans itself, like, I can't stand it. It's become like this thing that we just throw into everything now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so watered down. And it makes me feel disgusted sometimes with myself because I feel like I'm a pretty regular dude. Like, I don't, there's nothing really wild about me. But yet, I see these transgender people and I hear these Tories and it's like, I know that people are going to, you know, associate me with them. And it just, it makes me feel like shit, to be honest, you know, because I, that's not me. You said Tories? Are we talking like the pardon? Sorry, stories. Oh, I heard Tories. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I don't know how to speak English sometimes, apparently. So <laughs> I'm thinking like, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, 
In the UK? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I'm in America. I'm trying to reconcile the conservative perspective there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I don't know. Just kind of frustrating. So I feel like pretty much my stance today on everything is like there's just gonna have to be at some point it's gonna have to be that transsexuals have their own group or i honestly feel like we're gonna be really screwed in the next few years so i agree with that one so something that a friend of mine has brought up is that it seems like the trans movements and all these tris that are representing us we've been infiltrated by the gay community the g the g is self-identifying as t mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is a lot of media publicizing why you don't even need to transition to be transgender. Like, for example, the bearded transgender. And essentially what you look at it as gay men, just flamboyantly gay men, seems like they just want to get in on the action so that maybe they can actually get it with mm -hmm. a straight man. Yeah. You know, like, what, what's the name of that asshole, that the makeup guy recently had a... James Charles, maybe? Yeah, yeah that one kept trying to trick straight men into having sex. I think that there's a lot of that mm -hmm. going on in the, the gay community insisting that they're secretly trans. And I say that because I've actually seen it. I, I had to deal with a coworker that was exactly that. He was doing this on a uh, grinder, passing himself off as uh, transgender just so that he could get it on with guys that want to get it on with a trans girl. And so I think that's what's going on is that they're like, mm -hmm. hey, there's an opportunity there. There's actually, to me, there's transphobia going on. They look at it as, hey, mm. you have men who are pretending to be women that are getting free sex with straight men. I want in on that. I want. I can do the same thing. That's fucked. So they don't really see us as, as women. They see us as men. So they want to do the same thing. Yeah, that's how I, was, I say that because probably because this one coworker told me as much and that that's his outlook. And I, I see that reflected in, in, in others as well. So... Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like, it's it's so insulting, honestly. It's so fucking insulting. But yeah, it's just like this thing that it's like trendy. It really is. It's really like trendy and it's it's hot. And you can, you know, gain your five minutes of fame yeah. if you just claim the trans card kind of today. And, and I find that it's so disgusting and insulting. But I don't know. I can't stand the fact that it's going to, like, if we don't do something to kind of, you know, change the narrative, like, it's really going to fuck us all over, you know? Um, well, the first thing we need to do is disassociate ourselves from the allies that are using us to promote their agenda. Right. But that's very hard to do when it literally it feels like the entire LGBT community is against us. You know what I mean? Like, how... I don't even know where to begin, you know, because it feels like I would be up against fucking everyone. So, no, it is it's going up against the entire LGBT community. It's also going up against mm -hmm. the intersectionalists, the, the woke crowd, right? So yeah. the people that use identity politics for their agenda. Right. Politically speaking, that earns a lot of brownie points, right? So it's very easy to manipulate us on the basis of our status. Like if you're transsexual, if you're transgender, you need to vote this way. You need to have this perspective. And if you don't, then, then you're a danger to the community. Yeah. You're betraying your brothers and sisters. Yeah, exactly. I mean, honestly, like, look, I understand that the president is not perfect, but the amount of fear mongering that's in the LGBT community is really annoying. I'm so tired of it. They make me feel like I have to wake up panicked every day. And I mean, it's really not, I don't know, like, I feel pretty grateful for the life that I live and the things that I'm able to do as a transsexual guy in a mostly conservative town. Like, I don't know who to believe. The life that I'm living and the experiences that I have or the shit that they're telling me. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, no, that's exactly it. And, and they would absolutely invalidate your experiences because it doesn't fit with their narrative. They've got a very romanticized narrative. Yeah, exactly. Real quick, I don't like our president, mm -hmm. but he actually gave a really good speech. And I cried mm -hmm. when I heard it. It involved uh, D-Day. He was talking about D-Day and, and what our soldiers went through. I thought that was just a very beautiful speech. Yeah. But he's a, he's a douchebag. And the yeah. vice president, his bulletproof vest, I call him because, you know, no one's going to want to give a Trump because no one wants Pence. No one wants Pence to be president. Yeah. Pence is a real threat. If you're aware of, of a homophobic, transphobic bigot, Mike Pence is the one that you, you don't want president. So anyone that wants to impeach Trump, right, are exactly. you kidding me? No, let him serve his term and then get someone proper in office. Yeah.
So, I mean, like, I think he can be a douchebag, and I think overall his ego is massive. And it is very clear that he doesn't know sometimes what he's talking about. For example, what he said in the Piers Morgan interview about the military trans ban thing, like, it seemed very sloppy. So it tells me that he's not clear on what he's doing. So maybe he's getting ideas from other people. I don't know. But overall, like, I don't think he's... (laughs) I probably get a lot of shit for this, but I don't think he's a monster that everybody makes him out. He he's just he needs to shut up sometimes, okay? Like a lot of times. You know what I'm saying? Like Did, have you ever seen those um those little walkers that babies have that have all the toys on them? All the buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Trump at the Oval Office desk, right? He thinks that he's got real buttons. He thinks he's got the nuclear launch codes. He doesn't. <laughs> he can't really do much. He can throw a fit, he can make a mess. He can make a whole yeah. bunch of messes, but he can't do any real damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, there are some things that I do like about him. So it, like, I'm not bothered by him as much as the LGBT community is. I am bothered when he says dumb shit and he says dumb shit a lot. But a lot of that, I wonder, like, and this is why I feel like maybe no more celebrity presidents, because I feel like in a way, because he stepped in as a celebrity, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, that's why we have the electoral college is, is, is because we didn't trust the yeah. partly because we didn't want the, the tyranny of the majority, but also because we didn't trust the people not to put someone in on a basis of something stupid and superficial. Yeah, we, sh- we really shouldn't have celebrity presidents. Even Reagan was a tool. Yeah, but we, I mean, I don't know if we can have like, I don't know if that's that could ever be a rule. Like, you know, I feel like that's kind of fucked. You well, can't just be like, no, because you were a celebrity because people change. You're so. right. Um, we also all live in this age of social media where you have to have social media to get elected. Twitter is essential to getting elected. In fact, there have been lawsuits where the, the candidate won because they were excluded from the platform and they shouldn't have been. So it is essential. And then of course, what that means sometimes is is pandering yeah. in a very particular kind of way on social media. And of course, we know that. So Trump is, is very good at tweeting all the time. And he knows that he'll get instant press. They, they say no news is bad news, right? There's no sense. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Ocasio-Cortez, same kind of personality. She's always in the media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's on Instagram a lot too, just like live streaming. So, I mean, she knows that coming off Relatable is going to get her votes. Like That's the future of politics if, we're, if we don't find some kind of paradigm shift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Overall, like, since we're on the politics topic, like, I just want to kind of... My take on this whole thing is like, I understand that LGBT is very left-leaning and I get that they paint uh, people on the right as being transphobic, homophobic. Like, I don't believe that everybody on the right is transphobic or homophobic. I do believe- What about Dave Rubin is, is a, well, he's a classical liberal, but he's essentially conservative. Yeah. yeah. Blair White is more conservative too. So my thing with this is like, the troubling thing that I see also with just the transgender community right now is when we behave like very aggressive, and push expectations on people that is how we get the right to actually fucking hate us and actually be transphobic because for the most part unless they're super religious and conservative for the most part these people don't fucking care okay like they don't care they just don't want us to and push our whatever you want to call it our beliefs or lifestyle there has to be a balance is my point a a very clear balance and to me it's like if we don't find a way to kind of just calm things in the LGBT community, like we're actually going to see massive amounts of transphobes and homophobes, you know? So what it used to be was a steady march towards progress. And we thought that happened in the nineties. Like, yeah, it, it didn't happen overnight. Like the acceptance of, of just being openly gay didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of work, mm-hmm. but it was steady acceptance that came through with exposure. Like yeah. just little by little, you have a, a gay character in a sitcom. Right. It just in a humorous setting, it broaches the subject. Then you get comfortable with that character mm-hmm. and maybe they're there as a butt of a joke, but little by little they become endearing. And then you have more serious gay characters. Yeah. And so I saw, I watched as my mother, a huge homophobe as a kid, she started watching, um, uh, Will and Grace, and in a matter of years, she's very accepting, and I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. And her eye for the straight guy, and a bunch of other shows that were pro gay and lesbian. People accepted Ellen, of course, mm-hmm. but it didn't happen overnight. It was steady progress. But what we're seeing is in this era, yeah. it seems like, in my perspective, 
It's like they've got a deadline to meet. Mm-hmm. And so now they've, they've cranked everything into overdrive. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. No, that's still true. Yeah. It's, it's scary. It's like, no, look at like this. It's like the frog in the pot, right? So I'm sure you've heard of the frog in the pot analogy. If you turn up the heat slowly, the frog won't pop out of the pot. But if you if you crank it right up, it realizes the temperature differential and it jumps right up. <laughs> yeah. So if you really want, if you want conservatives or, or the haters to accept us, just slow changes over time. And I think most conservatives are okay with that too. Yeah. And most conservatives are more on the libertarian side. But like you said, you know, when you go too far, people end up moving further to the right. It's like a self-preservation. Like they recognize that danger and they clench up. That they get extra restrictive, and then then you, you yeah, see more exactly. of those austere measures taking place. So, yeah, yeah, it's like if we weren't so damned proselytizing, so damn preachy, you know, trying to change the culture, yeah. where it's obvious that we're trying to change the culture, because this is all part of the culture wars, then th- that they would be less likely to try and stop it. No, yeah, and you pointed something out that I, you're kind of right. Um, I'm like thinking about just you know a gay acceptance and things like that, like that happened way more gradual than this. Right. So you're, you're right. Like I'm trying to remember back to the nineties and like, it it was slowly but surely getting there, but transgender just kind of happened overnight and like, boom, like gender identity. There was a time where the people in the trans community were like, we hate the HRC because they and the rest of the gay community have just forsaken us. They've done Mm -hmm. nothing for us. They've done absolute shit for us. All they care about is the gay community. Suddenly now, overnight seems they care. This is their yeah. number one issue. And I think it's because it, it benefits the gay community. It does, yeah, because it's a selling point right now. You know, it's, it's a great way for corporations to pander and kind of, you know, oh, we're for trans people. So, I mean, it's like the fucking Gillette commercial the other day. You know, a trans guy shaving with his dad for the first time. Cool. And then it's always just making sure we use the word trans in everything now. So it's kind of... I don't know. I find it gross, uh, to be honest, but, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's, they're now comfortable enough to actually have those ads. The thing is, if they could have had those ads out before, they would mm-hmm. have. Because, yeah, it's a market they can target. But they couldn't do it so brazenly for it. But now, even if it was risky right now, this is the time to do it. Yeah. Because the left does that now. It's all part of the woke culture. Of course, they say, get woke or and go broke. And I think that in some cases we still see those, those mistakes being made where companies insist we have to do this because they've got this pressure online, especially from Twitter, which Twitter is not real life. But do these companies know that? I don't think they do. I don't think our politicians do either. So they hear all this pressure, which not only is it not real life, by the way, mm-hmm. you actually have bots, you have fake accounts yeah. that are designed to help perpetuate a story or a perspective. So someone says something and then suddenly you actually have a group of bots that work in unison to, to uh, bolster your side. So it, you've got false numbers behind you and people are like, wow, you've got like 700 retweets for this. <laughs> I guess people really do care. No, it's not, not really the case. It's, you've got bots, you've got people paying services to put machines out there to falsely amplify your, your story. And of course, like after a certain point though, by the way, like it's kind of weird the way the metrics go, but after you get to a certain point, then you actually do get a natural backing behind it. You got to get past that threshold because people like, jump on bandwagons before that point, people don't really care. But yeah, so you've got companies responding to uh, what they think are real people getting behind an idea. And it's just not true. They think they have to do this or people won't think that they, they care. And they have to have that image. That they all, all they care about is their image. You know what I think? I think there should be, and controversial probably, but I'm not so sure the T should be in the LGBT. But second of all, like the T shouldn't be transgender. It should just be transsexual. And they should be like another G in there or just pull it apart. I don't know, whatever. But I feel like there should be a G for gender nonconforming. I agree. Yeah. I just thought about this, but like, and under that, there could just be fucking everything. You want to have a thousand genders, throw it under that shit. But leave the actual word trans to just transsexual. Because it's just a clusterfuck, and I feel like it would fix... I mean, but again, like, I don't know how to make this happen. I'm, like, we'd be up against powerful people that are now, you know, removing, you know, gender dysphoria as a mental illness. Like, it's it's just... 
it's like this impossible war to, to win, you know? So uh, the mental illness and the fact that we call it transsexual is tied into the same thing. There's a, this fear of the stigma behind that because of connotations to it. So like you can't say transsexual because then people think that it's a sexuality disorder. Yeah. And then if you say, you know, it's a mental illness, well, then there's shame in mental illness. But there shouldn't be. True. There really shouldn't be shame in mental illness. Let's say you're bipolar. That's not your fault. It's something you have to live with. You have to manage. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. But don't hold it against anybody for that. But I think it's due to the fact that being trans, it's not just like if it is a mental illness. It's because people see that and now they know that it also means you're going to medically transition, get surgery. And for a lot of people, they, they see that and they think that's insane. That's you're mutilating yourself. Like that's a crazy person thing. So whether you call it like, here's my thing with it. Like, I don't care if it's called mental illness. Cause to me, I feel like to some level it has to be because yeah. gender dysphoria is a hundred percent in my head, you know? So it has to be at some level, but whether it's in the book written mental illness or not, it doesn't matter because people are still going to think this is crazy because we're kind of changing our body. Like that's, that's intense. Right. I have a question. What are your thoughts on, um, on transhumanism. <laughs> Funny you bring this up because like I haven't looked into it. This guy that I follow um, has been posting about it on Instagram and I saved the link and I brief, I kind of skimmed over it and I got mad. So I just stopped. I'll have to look more into it. But I right off the bat, I couldn't stand the fact that the word trans again is in there. Right. So I'm like, why is transhumanism now a fucking word? Transhuman though, isn't isn't really tied to transgender exactly, but it's kind of true. It, it is and it isn't. It's kind of like convergent evolution. You know, two different yeah. creatures come up with the same development, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like the only reason I got bothered by that is just because immediately that's what the general public, like anything that says trans something, they automatically link it to us. In this post that he put out there, what I saw was, again, just people just, you know, they're kind of, saying things like transgenders are ruining the civilization and you know basically stuff like that and so it's like it becomes very frustrating i understand it's not obviously the same but for just your average person they'll see transhumanism or whatever and they're gonna think like once again it's transgender people trying to like you know at attack the world and yeah yeah that's ignorance of course though yeah of course you don't have to pay them any mind mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're talking about then i'm not gonna yeah. pay you any mind at all but i would say tra's are ruining humanity. TRAs, a lot of them are, are going out of their way to push things that they really shouldn't be. Yeah. Some of it's getting quite dangerous. Yeah, and, and TRAs, for anybody that's listening doesn't know, is trans activists. Yeah, trans, trans activists. And so some of them, they have absolutely no problem alienating and encroaching on others' rights. It's like, it's not a right if you have to erase someone else's right. So if you're like, Okay, I'm a biological woman. I created this organization for biological women. Mm -hmm. And I get funding so that I can help out other biological women. Oh, I'm getting government funding. I guess I have to help trans women now. Mm, that's not right. Sorry. It really shouldn't be like that. Right. They created these spaces, created these organizations. It's for them to do. Let them have their spaces. Let us create our own spaces. If we do the right thing, we walk the walk, we talk the talk. Over time, they will accept us. Yeah. We don't have to push like that, but no, we insist on getting the law to bully them into complying or defunding them. Yeah. But then of course the question becomes, well, what spaces can we go to? And then of course, and then it becomes this argument of, well, you have passing privilege. So what, right. you know, why do you get to use these spaces and I don't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. The end thing is passing is, it really is a privilege. I can say that even for myself, I have passing privilege some of the time, but yeah, but it's a privilege that you worked for. It, it wasn't, that's my, that's my thing. Well, no, yes and no. I mean, yes, they've worked for it, but at the same time, mm -hmm. there are some people that work for it that are never going to get there because they can't afford to have major reconstructive surgery just to pass. Like if you have like a very jutting jawbone and prominent brow bone, like you're six foot five and you, you've got a deep voice, there's no chance that you're not going to be seen. Okay. Let me re let me rephrase that. I, I understand what you're saying. There are not very many women that are like, let's say, six two or whatever. I, I get what you're saying, but my overall point is, yes, there are some distinct things that you may have that might clock you, but how you carry yourself and 
interact with people, I think comes a very long way. And so like, if you're going to be an aggressive trans activist that punches women, well, no, nobody wants you in their fucking space. Like, that's the thing. Like, I don't know. I, I try not to look at it as a privilege because I feel like I'm not trying to be a dick to anybody. And I don't think you are either. So is it a privilege or is it just being a decent human being and trying to kind of assimilate? You know what I mean? So when I say privilege, what I, what I just mean to say is it, you can take a picture, like a still picture of someone, and they can absolutely pass in that still picture and no one guesses. And so from a far distance, people might guess. Gotcha. But yeah, absolutely. The, the way they move, the way they talk, their energy. Yeah. You can know if they worked on it or not, right? Yeah. And so then that's it's not privilege. That's, they earned that. I've, I've definitely encountered uh, trans women who, if you, you look at them, they don't pass. Watch them, they do. And that's, a, that's the difference is everything else is there except that superficial. And because everything else is there, yeah, it makes up for the rest. I've seen it. It's, I'm like, wow. Yeah. You really radiate that feminine energy. And I agree. And of course, yeah, some people are just very, very passable, you know, and there's very little effort and yeah. I get it. Um, I guess maybe I just, I don't know. I feel like the word privilege is just thrown around so much in this community that I feel like it's kind of like for the wrong reasons. Well, it's like, this. it's like, if you believe in God, God blessed some of us with looking mm -hmm. the way we want to look more or less, maybe more androgynous. And so now we don't have to work as hard at certain aspects like the face, yeah. right? So great. That's one last thing to fixate on. But yeah, absolutely. The rest is very, very important. Many of us only focus on superficial and that's what ends up betraying us, I think. You have a lot of what I see is basically cross justice that are trying to pass themselves off as, as transsexual, calling themselves transgender. And they end up giving us a bad name. They, they end up being very, very rude and obnoxious and misogynistic even. Yeah. I've been blocked by a lot of them, actually. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like a war zone. It's kind of crazy, just the whole transgender thing. It's like there's trans activists then there's other people like that are possibly not even trans, but they're, you know, using that because they can, because anybody can be trans. It's just a word that's been watered down. So right. anybody can self-identify and that's, that's the dangerous thing about it is even the arguments that you like, well, before, if you wanted to use the, the restroom that you felt comfortable in, you really had to work for it, you know? And then of course the laws changed over time where like, yeah, you can use those restrooms, but now you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is self-identify and like instantly. Like, yeah, I'm suddenly a woman. I can use a woman. Yeah. Term. And suddenly you're on a one-on-one -on -one situation that, uh, with like a 13-year-old girl. Like the first thing I think of is, uh, can I say that name? What name? The Canadian. The Canadian. Yeah, don't use their first name, but yeah, they use their last name. Go. Yeah, name who has that tampon fetish yeah. with a 13-year-old girl. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Crazy as fuck. Right. And then I think like, I guess the problem is also you don't ever see the transgender community calling out people like that. And I think a lot of it comes from like, they assume that because there's, you know, let's say one bad seed that people are just going to assume that we're all shit, but yeah, that's not the case. You know, I, like I understand that not every woman or every trans woman that's maybe not passable that goes into the women's restroom. I understand that they're not all like creepy pedophiles, but I do understand that by creating self-identification, which means you don't need to medically transition. You could just like literally just yeah, be right. as you are. You're given more dice to roll. Exactly. Which is like that at the end of the day, that's going to hurt us more than anything. So why, why? Yeah. So yeah, it's super frustrating, but. Yeah. And besides the, the bathroom thing, of course, you also have the prisons. I don't know if you follow enough, you probably wouldn't because they're horrible people. I know some good, well-reasoned, gender-critical feminists. I also know a lot of them are absolute horrible people. That not only are they, they transphobic, they're misandronists. They hate men, and they hate trans women because they look at them as men. There's just this vicious hatred, zero sensitivity, and any positive feminine energy that you would think would be associated, no. There's nothing maternal with them either. There's just this hatred this but i followed some of them on uh, reddit and sometimes they, they share some useful information such as in the prison systems you have abuse where people will say that they're transgender and then they get to go to the women's prisons 
And what do we find? They're assaulting women there. So that, yeah, that's, they can get away with it over there, more or less, because there are... Just to be clear for anybody that's listening, like, you're referring to the UK, because I don't think that happens in the States. I think I've seen a couple in the States. Hasn't it? Mm. I, I don't have the, okay. the articles right now, so, but, you know, what, you know, citation needed, you can, you can just dismiss it, but... Thing is, I know that it does happen. But then, of course, people would respond to what you said with, well, trans women are under attack and in danger if you put them with men in a prison. So, Oh, absolutely. To me, the most terrifying thing to do is to, to put them in a population. Okay, so I think trans people really need their own prisons. So I'm, not, I'm not even kidding. I think that... Well, their own prison, like a whole fucking building? Because I don't, I don't know. You know what? I think that maybe they do. I think that maybe they need to be sent to their own. If, if you have to, like, have one mm -hmm. transgender prison per state, right? And it, that means that you have to ship them 500 miles away. So you're in Texas, right? Just because they're transgender. So be it. It's for their own good. The reality is sexual assault is very high in prisons. If you're male to female and you really are transsexual, you have a high chance of getting raped. And if you're not really transsexual, but you say you're transgender, then you might actually be one of those people that does rape. <laughs> if you're not a male, you have a high chance of getting raped. Yeah. Too. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know about, I don't agree with that. Like a, maybe a wing, maybe like a wing where we can put, you know, trans women or trans men or whatever, but I don't. What is happening is cases which is the scary part is for their own good they're put in solitary that's not good that's not a solution yeah no that's not a solution either so like i used to i used to work at a prison so there was a trans woman there very young actually probably early 20s who was in there for something pretty disgusting and was going to get out probably not even a year later but yeah she was in there for basically having sex with like a minor or something like that right and the whole time she was there uh, she was crying all the time, you know, just, you know, it was the end of the world. She was placed in the male population, had her own cell, and then eventually was moved to the infirmary, which is kind of like, you know, a wing where nurses can attend to you. And, and again, in her own cell. So technically, she was still a part of population, but in her own cell. Now, I, I would always read why people were in prison, okay? And I read hers and... uh at the time, I was really disgusted, and it automatically made me hate myself because all I could think was this person is identifying as a transgender woman, and I'm technically, you know, I'm a, a transsexual man or transgender man, however you want to say it, and people are going to associate me with this garbage person. And it made me really upset. It really did. I was so mad, and now this was like several years before any of this shit hit the fan now with the whole like you know especially in the uk you get a trans woman you put them in with the women and there's been cases where they assault the women and so like a lot of that kind of resonates with me and i and i fucking i hear you loud and clear trust me it's very frustrating and all i can say to that is like at the end of the day like look if you have like been dis a disgusting human being to somebody else i really don't have a lot of pity for you so i don't care where in that case they stick somebody like that now, if it's a trans woman that's in prison for theft or something like that, I think that that person is maybe less of a threat and we could put them in a special wing or something. But still, I don't know if they – it depends. A lot of it depends, and this, of course, is also women, right? Women, their concerns a lot of the time is, you know, is this person near me going to have a penis? That's like 100% most of the concern, and I get it. And so – I don't know, like a lot of this is probably going to sound fucking transphobic, whatever. But my point is, is like, I feel that there are different circumstances that we can work around and we should work around. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't be just like, okay, trans women, they get to go wherever they want. No, because you're in prison. So fuck you. you know? Yeah, you're in prison. You, you realize that you don't have freedom. It's not meant to be a comfortable situation. Right. But then, of course, the other aspect of this is like, I'm not trying to be a heartless dick. I understand that, especially with trans women, there is a massive issue with nobody really wants to talk about this. But the issue with trans women is like a lot of them do get involved in sex work. A lot of them do end up dead. You know, in the cases that let's say you're pushed into sex work and now you're arrested and now you're stuck in prison. Whose fault is that? You know what I mean? Like, I don't I'm not trying to, to screw anybody over here, but. I think we need to be more reasonable about it. I don't know how, but we should, there should be kind of a, based on circumstances and, and things like that. I don't know. You know what I mean? 
I think, first of all, sex work should never be criminalized. I, I don't think that's right. I think that we should have laws that protect bodily autonomy, personal agency. So if you choose to engage in sex work, that's you. I don't agree with it. Although, to be honest, there was a time when I sort of did something like that. But I still think that, yeah, it's not healthy psychologically. Regardless of how anybody feels about it, you should have that freedom. Yeah, I have very mixed thoughts on sex work. Like, my whole thing is, at the end of the day... I'm always going to wish that a woman gets involved in some other sort of work than sex work. Right. That's just me because I think a woman is worth way more than just selling her body. Again, I understand some people are, enjoy this. They want to do this. And I do believe they should be able to do that. But the problem with that is it's such a toxic industry that is controlled by mostly men that has a lot of trafficking, that has a lot of minors. And so at the end of the day, it's kind of like, I don't know if decriminalizing it is going to solve everything. So the question is how that might go about it. I actually wrote about what a scenario might be like where it ended up backfiring, where when you decriminalize it, essentially you would open it up to regulation like any other market. But once you regulate it, then you have a whole certain standards, kind of like with the porn industry, right? Like you have to get regularly tested. But I propose that to properly regulate it, you'd have to be part of a brothel. If you're part of a brothel, you're part of a business. And because of mm -hmm. the quality of laws on the books, you would be forced to have sex with any clients that comes before you because otherwise it'd be discrimination and you can't refuse service. Kind of like with the bake a cake deal, you know, you're like, you refuse to bake a cake for a gay couple. Well, I refuse to have sex with someone because of same sex. Well, that's kind of different though. Well, I know, but uh, I, I look at it as though if, if you're not careful, it's like, well, do you want to be in business or not? Like you have the choice not to engage in that, but then do you? Yeah, but the whole bake a cake thing was, they don't mind baking a cake for LGBT. They don't want to bake a cake that says congratulations on your gay marriage or, so it's kind of a little bit different in that sense, I think. Right, and, and, and that's fair. Point being that the argument was that if you're, th this is the rhetoric that they kept using, which is if you're open for business, you're open for anybody. I kept seeing the, the slogans going around where people had mm -hmm. signs out there about that but imagine that when it comes to prostitution that's the prevailing rhetoric and i'm actually kind of hearing that from the trans community which is saying that if you're really a lesbian then you should be okay with sleeping with trans women because trans women are women they try to coerce this is one of the reasons why the the gender critical turfs get upset is because they feel like they're being coerced or pressured in, into having sex with essentially men and they feel like that there's some erasure going on. And and I get this, this, this argument. Right. But um, yeah, I think that something like that might manifest if you, if you try to legalize prostitution, if you're not careful. But potentially, though, by legalizing it, you might be able to shut down the sex traffic if you regulate it right. It's, uh, it, but it's a tri tricky subject. And, and yeah, no one should have to be getting into sex work. Yeah. And we do want to shut it down, especially uh, the underground Obviously, underground sex work needs to be destroyed. This is the kind of topic that I, I mean, like, I, I want to be reasonable, but there's a lot of, you would have to really convince me. I, I don't know what the solution is. I just know, like, I always just think about the amount of victims that come from that industry. And that's why I'm always like, it's not good. But again, I understand if somebody wants to do that, fine. But at the same time, it's just kind of one of those things where, Personally, for me, what bothers me more about sex work lately is, again, I, I understand you want to do sex work, but for some reason, like, especially in the trans community, it's kind of seen as this thing, you know, like, where like, oh, you're a trans woman should do sex work, or it's kind of seen as like a positive thing. And maybe it is to some people, but what I'm trying to get to here is it's not all you can be, you can be more. And so- Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean- it gives us a bad rap. That used to be for a long time, too. The huge stigma is if you're transsexual, then chances are you were a porn star or you were you were otherwise working on the street and no one wanted that reputation. Yeah. Transgender is just so much more palatable. I think that that was the wrong way to go because then, yeah, that opened us up for other people that really shouldn't have been joining mm -hmm. and, and taking our identity. A lot of it, too, comes from just like this idea that if you're trans, you're discriminated against and it's hard to find work. So therefore a lot of trans women are in sex work. And while I do, I, I want to say that's possible, but. That used to be the case a lot, not so much anymore, but that absolutely used to be the case a lot, but a lot has changed over the years. 
Yeah. So that's kind of where I stand too, is like, I feel like definitely back in the day, but I feel that things have changed so much that I just can't imagine it's that impossible all the time. And so I don't know, just maybe I'm just being too positive, but I just, I wish there was more role models in the community that were like, yeah, like you, if you want to do sex work, fine, but there's, there's more things you can do. Like the world isn't going to discriminate against you all the time. I don't like to point out this one person because I hate this person because they're horrible TRA and this caused a lot of damage. But Rachel McKinnon is a biologist, I believe. Mm -hmm. At least some kind of scientist. You know, you want to point more role models like that. You know, like this is what you can be as as transsexual. Yeah. Just if anybody doesn't know who that is, you want to kind of clarify. Uh, well, this person won a couple of competitions as a cyclist. I think took the top prize in cycling and women's cycling and uh, is a huge trans athlete advocate that insists that if you're biologically male, that there's no difference from a biological female in competition, but it doesn't give you an edge. And so they shut down all those that say that, you know. In other words, this, this person has accomplished great things, let's say, but they are a little bit hateful towards women. So that's not good. And, and don't want to have any nuanced conversation about what it means to be a transgender and athlete. Yeah. The thing is, I think that we do need to have that nuanced, nuanced conversation, but Rachel McKenna has go, gone so extreme that uh, she said that she would like to see TERFs. I think she said TERFs, or maybe it was just cis people. I don't know. But see them burned in a grease fire. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that and I was pretty gross and people want to say well she was joking like the only people that i ever joke about like to that level is like mutual like friends you know you're not gonna just say that out and on twitter so everybody can see it because then i don't think that message is going to be received in a very haha -ha, joking way i mean well, that's not, not only that but for a while her background image on twitter was her with the brick and fire behind her yeah so it was right after that so it seemed like yeah she really did want to have that image of it. some aggressive tra that doesn't take shit from from the haters and the thing is it's not haters but if you disagree with her then you were a hater that's she blocked me. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, no doubt. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to, I guess, let's wrap this up. Um, unless you wanted, if there was anything else you wanted to go over, Jadis. What I'd like to see is a stronger push for among our LGBT youth, just among the younger generations. Get them to be more aware of what gender nonconforming behavior is and understand that you can be yourself without having to take on the identity of the other gender because... What ends up happening is people do conflate gender identity with gender non-conforming behavior. And they get pushed along that path. And people encourage you. Like if you say that, hey, I'm thinking of transitioning, you will be encouraged every step of the way. And yeah. for some, that's great. You have a support group there. For others, they end up encouraging you down the wrong path. And then you end up hearing about some of those D sister stories. Uh, do you follow Benjamin Boyce, by the way? Of course, yeah, I do. So I, I love Benjamin Boyce, and um, I, I think of him as the the Jane Goodall of trannies. <laughs> yeah, he's done a good job of documenting all these different stories. Yeah, from the trans community. And so people say that he is he's one sided. He doesn't want to hear the mainstream transgender perspective. The reality is that's one sided. So the the mainstream perspective is one face of a gem. 100%. And so he's showing all the other facets. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. I think he's doing really good work. And I think that he does a lot of good for the trans community by sharing those different and distinctly human stories. Exactly. Yeah, no, totally. Um, sad to say that <laughs> it takes Benjamin Boyce to do that, you know, just an ordinary fucking guy. But yeah, you don't hear any of us talking on social media being held up high by any LGBT otherwise. Right. Like, we're just kind of, like, under the rug, like, we don't exist. Exactly. And especially for those of us who are more moderate. And I consider myself more of a moderate, politically speaking, even. Like, I'm, I'm a, mm -hmm. a left-leaning, right? But I'm still closer to the center. I'm very anti-authoritarian. And so that's one of my biggest problems with the, the political left is how authoritarian they've become. It used to be that the right was very authoritarian. Not so much anymore. I mean, you do have some of that, but it's a lot more on the left. It's a lot more aggressive. And it's pushing people out in a way. Benjamin is a lefty. Yeah. But he's still being painted as, as alt-right. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, yeah, because anybody that is even 
slightly not left leaning to the full extent is alt right. I mean, which is insane. But I mean, I'm, I mean, I hope I'm wrong with this. But if the if the left side is that authoritarian, like eventually the right will have to become that. And I, I really hope not. But that's the only conclusion here. If we don't just especially when you have them promoting violence towards yeah. the right, so they will create their own enemies. Like you encourage people to throw a milkshake, you encourage people to punch a Nazi. Mm -hmm. You're not expecting people to to get aggressive and stand up for themselves. I'm sorry, but generally speaking, they stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like they, they might let you take a few shots, but eventually they're not they're not going to let themselves be bullied by what they consider to be puny weakling from the perspective. And in some cases, they really are because. They're collectivists, right? The leftists, far left, are collectivists. They're like a bunch of, they're like a gang, like street gang, can't hack it on their own. They can't engage on a one-on-one -on -one fight. They have to have their numbers. There's safety in numbers. It was gang up in, in strong numbers. On Twitter, uh, I get bombarded by not just one person, but like hundreds of people will try to shut me down and, and some of my friends because you can't, you can't have just a one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and agree or disagree. No, if you disagree with someone, they get all their buddies to gang up on you and, and bully you into submission. And in the, on the street, they do the same thing in, in any rallies. Like if you're if you're conservative or you're pro-Trump, even just mildly so, you know, you're not like really far right nationalist. No, you just believe in nationalism. You believe in putting this country first. You're an old man celebrating this country. You get beat up by Antifa. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff actually happens. So incidentally, uh, Tim Pool, I don't know if you follow him. Yeah, I do. He's done a good job documenting this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, and it was uh, AOC that said that calling yourself moderate is bad or something. Like, so, I mean, it's like, I've always called myself moderate conservative, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of things that I do lean on the right on, but I'm also willing to change my mind and I'm not like that extreme about my views. So, and I've taken the political test online. It always says I'm a centrist. So <laughs> like, but, but even being in the center now is just bad according to, right. to these politicians. The center is now right. <laughs> yeah. Further left and, and it's getting more and more extreme. And if we don't show these people that we're not going to tolerate it, they're just going to keep pushing that envelope. And eventually it's, it's going to lead to a civil war. And I'm, I'm not even joking. Yeah, no, I'm not... I'm not going to argue that because there, there's only one way it'll end and it won't be good. It, it'll especially not be good for LGBT people, which is what blows my mind. It's like, you guys think what you're doing is going to help anybody. It's not. And it's definitely going to screw us over more than anyone else. You know, that is my biggest problem, especially with the TRAs. Keep, they keep pushing and pushing. Yeah. They're, they're going to end up reversing everything we've worked for. Mm -hmm. And that terrifies yeah. me. Then we'll have to go back into hiding again. And I, I don't want to. I'm not fucking doing that. I can't do that. That's not going to happen. So yeah, I'm with you totally. But yeah, I think we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think it sounds good. I was surprised how far this came. It feels weird not having my co-host. I thought this was pretty well regardless. So hopefully you were able to get everything out there that you wanted to say. But thanks for coming on the show. And like every other guest, of course, you're welcome back. Like I enjoy talking to you. So thank you. No problem. I enjoyed being here. And until next time, thanks for listening, guys. Peace.